Please take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, our text this morning begins in verse 12, really extends to the end of the chapter. All through this gospel, from the very first verse on, we have seen over and again how Mark has been making a big argument about who Jesus is and what he's come to do. From the very first verse, we heard that it was about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. And that hasn't changed. All throughout this gospel, Mark has had that, that target in view, that we might see that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And so it is in this text. The authority that is, that with which Jesus operates is the authority of the Messiah, the authority of the Son of God, the beloved Son in whom the Father is well pleased. But that has import not just for this scene here in this text, this is import for you and me. When we come this morning, we come not, not simply hearing Bible stories. We come this morning to hear Jesus speak by his word with his authority as prophet, priest, and king. And so, so to hear Jesus being held up, displayed before our eyes as the Messiah, the Son of God, it actually demands a response. It's, it's not simply information to be received rather it's a gospel to be acted upon but in order for us to see and to hear and to believe and to act we need God's help so let's ask him for it would you pray with me almighty God we do come and we ask for the help of the Holy Spirit Holy Spirit we pray come open our eyes of faith that we might see glorious riches in this portion of your gospel. And so seeing and hearing, believing and acting, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So Mark chapter 11, beginning in verse 12. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf... He went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. And they came to Jerusalem. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who brought bought in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seat of those who sold pigeons, and he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him. Because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. And as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you've done anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. And they came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him, and they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things, or who gave you this authority to do them? And Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question, answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? 
answer me. And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from man, they were afraid of the people, for they all held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I wonder if, if you ever did this or tried to deal with your children in this way when they asked you to do something, something that, that really was on the borderline, you could say yes, but you didn't really feel super good about it. And so after thinking it over and perhaps talking with your spouse, you, you decide to, to deny the request. But, but children being children, of course, they want a reason, so, so you begin quite thoughtfully, quite, quite reasonably, well, well, honey, I, you know, I just don't feel very good about this. I, I know it's not bad in and of itself, but, but I, I think it would be better for you, better for us, if we just didn't do this right now. But of course, that's, that's not good enough for your child, and so they launch a, a counter-argument which means then that you have to respond and you're still keeping your patience and so you're still gentle and as you respond again, which brings further counter-arguments, reasons why such a thing has to be done and pleadings from every corner and evidence of the genius of other parents who allowed their children to do those very things. Until finally, you've had enough and you go to that line that every parent throughout six millennia has used. Honey, no. We're not going to do this. But dad, why? Because I said so. I can tell by some of the response that you might have used that line. All of us have. That line works ultimately because it's an appeal to authority. It's your authority as a father or as a mother, which at the end of the day decides the matter. But there's a sense in which, central to this scene that we have read from verses 12 to 33, what you have here is a question concerning authority. When the Sanhedrin's commission comes to Jesus in verse 28 and asks them, asks Jesus, by what authority are you doing these things or who gave you this authority to do them, they were actually asking the right question, that this is a question of authority but not just a question of authority. I mean, even when you appeal to your authority because I said so, you're appealing to your authority, which is rooted in your identity. Because you're the father or because you're the mother, because of that identity, you have authority to make a decision. And so when the Sanhedrin's commission comes to Jesus and says, by what authority or who gave you this authority, they're not simply asking the question about authority, they're also asking Jesus a question about identity. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Of course, answering the questions of Jesus' authority and identity is not just a first century problem. No, friends, that's, that's the problem that's set before you this morning. Because Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, he's here. He's present with us. As I declare him to you, you have something to do. This isn't just a speech. It's not a performance. I'm not going to get reviews on Broadway. It's not something for you to go out and say, well, you know, Sean was a little off his game this morning. Yeah, maybe it was a B plus. No. No, Jesus the Christ is in our midst. His authority is being displayed as his identity as prophet, priest, and king is being declared to you. And you have something to do. How are you going to respond? Are you going to rest in him and trust him and follow him? Or are you going to reject his authority over you? Those are the only two choices. Jesus makes that plain in this passage. As we see him declare his word with authority as the prophet. Jesus and his disciples return back from Jerusalem to Bethany. And as they are, as they are coming, 
Jesus sees this, this fig tree. It's mid-April. And just as here in Memphis, mid-April means the trees are starting to bud and things are starting to, to grow again, so it is in this scene. Jesus sees this fig tree and it has leaves and it was the case with these kind of trees in that kind of place at that kind of time. Though it was unusual, it wasn't completely uncommon for fig trees to have leaves at that time. But when they had leaves, it meant there was fruit. So Jesus goes over, seeing the leaves on the fig tree looking for fruit. Wouldn't have been ripened fruit. It was unripe and yet still edible. But when Jesus comes, what does the Bible say? When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. Lots of leaves, lots of show, lots of appearance, no fruit. And Jesus' response to the entire situation seems incredibly harsh to us, doesn't it? Verse 14, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. What happens? Well, the next day... As they're passing by, back on their way to Jerusalem, verse 20, as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. What does that mean? Well, it means that Jesus has authority to deliver the word of God with power. And he has authority to deliver the word of God with power because he's a prophet, He has the ability not just to foretell certain things. We saw that in the previous passage, didn't we? Jesus was able to tell his disciples there's going to be a cult tied up at a certain place. This is going to be the response. People are going to ask you, this is what you're going to say. And it happened just as Jesus said. Jesus had authority as a prophet to foretell the future. But here, he has the authority of a prophet to foretell. To say what is true, to give the word of God and have power attached to it in such a way that there is action involved. That was the Old Testament office of the prophet. But Jesus was not simply a prophet, he is the prophet, the great prophet, the one who who was able to astonish those who heard him. Because he declared the word of God with authority and power. We saw the crowds astonished even in our text in verse 18. And you see it. They feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. That's been the keynote of Jesus' teaching. All the way back to chapter 1. In Mark chapter 1 verse 22. They were astonished at his teaching. Why? For he taught them as one who had authority. And not as the scribes. Why does Jesus have authority? Why is it that when he declares the word of God, he declares the word of God in such a way that it comes with power, that it actually does what he declares? It's because he's the prophet, the prophet that Moses had promised so many years before. In Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, Moses had said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him that you should listen. That's Jesus. But listen, Jesus wasn't just a first century prophet declaring the word of God with power. No, Jesus still declares his word with power today as he takes up the office of the prophet. How does he do that? How does Jesus speak to you today as the prophet of God? Well, he he does so through his word. Day by day. In your morning worship, as you pick up this book and you open it, the Spirit uses this word so that Jesus' voice is clearly heard. Jesus doesn't speak through signs and visions and voices in your head. Jesus' voice is connected to his word. And the Holy Spirit speaks to you through Holy Scripture. So day by day, as you spend time in God's word, Jesus the prophet is declaring his word to you with power. But preeminently, Jesus speaks to you here. All of the great Reformed confessions in the 16th and 17th century, the Belgic Confession, the First Helvetic Confession, our own Westminster Confession, declares this plainly, that the preaching of the Word of God is the Word of God. So that what's being declared to you this morning isn't simply Sean's word, no 
that we believe and teach, and Jesus evidences this throughout Scripture, that what's declared to you this morning is Jesus' word. He speaks to you here. That's where you hear the voice of God. It's in the ministry of the word as the Spirit takes his word and applies it to your hearts. Now, there's a way you can not hear Jesus speak to you. You can close the book. You can not pick it up. Days and weeks, months even go by without picking up God's word. And what are you going to find? Well, Jesus isn't speaking to you because he speaks through his word by his spirit. You know how else you cannot hear Jesus' voice? Don't show up here. Because, because it's here in the preaching of the word, in the context of corporate worship, on the Lord's day, that Jesus preeminently speaks his word to you because he still moves in our midst as a prophet. He still declares his word with power and authority. And when Jesus speaks, things happen. Men, women, boys and girls are converted. Sins that we wrestle with, we gain some measure of victory over. Problems that we face and we, they seem insuperable to us suddenly become clear. When we hunger and thirst, Psalm 63 tells us we come to the sanctuary and we behold the, our God with power. How's that possible? It's through his word. Jesus still is working today. He has authority as a prophet and he points to himself with that word as the great priest. Indeed, the great high priest who has authority over us. In fact, this entire text is one of Mark's sandwiches. We've noticed these all the way along through Mark's gospel. Verses 12 to 14, you have this scene with the fig tree. And then the fig tree is brought back up in verses 20 and 21. The fig tree withers, which means verses 15 to 19, the meat in the middle. It's the point of the entire scene. And it's, it's, as we look at this, what we see is that Jesus has authority not only to declare his word with power, but he has authority as the chief priest, as God's great high priest, to declare his will concerning his house. Jesus enters into the temple in verse 15 as the master of the house. Did you see it? Verse 15, they came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. This temple to which Jesus has come is actually the third temple that was built on that site. The first temple being Solomon's temple described in 1 Kings. The simple, second temple, Zerubbabel's temple described in the books of Haggai and Zechariah toward the end of the Old Testament. The third temple is this one, Herod's temple, which is not yet complete when Jesus enters into it. But Herod's temple is this massive complex. And as you enter into the temple, there's a series of interconnected squares that get narrower and narrower. The outer square is the court of the Gentiles. All may come there, but only those consecrated Jews, males and females, could enter into the next court, the court of the women. Consecrated, purified males, Jewish males, would enter into the next court, which is the court of Israel. Only priests would go into the next, the holy place. And only the chief priests once a year went into the center square, the holy of holies. Jesus in this scene is in that outer square, the court of the Gentiles. And what does he find there? Well, he finds those who sold and those who bought in the temple. These would have been the money changers, those who took the, the Roman coins with the face of the emperor, which Jews thought was idolatrous, they would take those Roman coins and exchange them for Jewish drachmas. And then there were animal sellers, and the animal sellers would take those Jewish drachmas and sell you whatever you needed for your sacrifice, a goat, a lamb, a turtle dove, a pigeon, depending on what you needed. But what does Jesus do? Well, he enters in. And he begins to drive the money changers out. He takes the tables and the chairs of the animal sellers and he overturns them. And he actually positions himself in such a way that he tries to prevent people coming and going to set up their tables and to sell their wares. Why does he do this? Well, he tells us, verse 17, is it not written, 
My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. It was the responsibility of the chief priest to administer the temple. The great high priest, elected by God's people, had responsibility for administering the temple. But Jesus comes and has authority to rule in that temple, but he has authority not only because he's the priest. What does he say? He says, this is my house. He's not simply saying, it is written, God says, is, no, he's, this is my house. And you have turned my house, which meant to be a prayer for all, a place of prayer for all the nations. You've made our, my house a robber's cave. In the buying and selling and exchanging and the priests receiving kickbacks and blocking out the areas where the nations might come to worship and pray. You've, you've clogged all those areas up with your merchandise and you've turned my house into a robber's den. How can Jesus say that? Well, he's the great high priest. He's the master of the house. And he's the master of the house, not only as the great high priest, but as God himself, saying that this, was, this is my house and this is my intention, was that my house would be for the nations. Friends, you know that this is, this is Jesus' house. This isn't my house, IPC. This isn't the elder's house. This isn't even your house. No, in 1965, when this church started, Jesus put his finger right on this place, and he said, this is my house. And what did he say about my house? He said, my house shall be a house of prayer for the nations, for all the nations, which means whether you're white or black or Latino or Asian, whether you're rich, middle class, poor, whether you're less educated, more educated, whether you're from Memphis or outside of Memphis, this house is a house of prayer for you because it's Jesus' house. He's the master of this house. He's the great high priest. He welcomes all into his place and says, come to my house as the great priest, I welcome you. He welcomes you not only as the master of the house, but as the mediator between God and men. This Jesus who cursed the fig tree ultimately is, is pronouncing judgment here. That's the import. Jesus, Jesus cursed the fig tree. The fig tree withered at the roots. Jesus brings judgment against the temple leadership and the temple itself, which means what? Well, the temple's leadership and the temple itself is going to wither at the roots. Someday it will be destroyed. And yet, when, when the disciples marvel at the fig tree, it would have been a great opportunity for Jesus to explain all of that. But he doesn't, does he? What does he say? Well, look at verse 22. Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, Whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you've received it and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if, if, any, if, you do, if you have anything against anyone so that your Father also is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Now, on the surface, that doesn't seem like that works, does it? I mean, Jesus, you could have explained this whole bit about the temple and the fig trees. That, that would have been the thing to do. Why are you talking about prayer? Well, it actually does follow. But think about it. Jesus cursed the fig tree. The fig tree withers. Jesus has declared judgment upon the temple and its leadership, which means what? The temple is going to be destroyed, as it is in AD 70. The temple leadership is going to go away, which means, how are you going to pray? To whom are you going to pray? Now, for us, 2,000 years after Jesus, that doesn't seem to be a live problem. But if you're a Jew, from 1 Kings 8 on, for a thousand years, you have been taught, when you pray, pray toward the temple. When you pray, look to the temple. When you pray, look to the God of the temple, yes, but position yourself towards the temple. But if the temple is going to be destroyed, and the temple leadership is going to be taken away, and the great high priest who rules over that temple is no more, then to whom are you going to pray? 
Well, the implication is obvious. You're going to pray to Jesus. Because Jesus is the master of the temple. And Jesus is the great mediator between God and men. And so when we pray, we don't pray to a place. We pray to a person who's able to intercede for us. Because in this Jesus, we have one who's who God himself who dwells in our midst. When he says, have faith in God, he's echoing what he's going to say just a couple of nights later. Up in the upper room in John chapter 14, he says, believe in God, believe also in me, for I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. This is the one who's the great mediator between God and men. This is the one who stands and enables our prayers, presents them before the Father, ever lives to make intercession for us. This is the one who makes it not only possible for us to forgive others, but actually forgives us so that we might forgive others. We make our prayers through this mediator, which means, friends, that you need a mediator. You need someone who's going to stand between you and God and God and you. And this Jesus stands before you this morning as the God-appointed mediator. Because if God is exactly who he says he is, is utterly holy and utterly righteous and utterly pure and utterly just, then what we've already confessed would damn us to hell. Because we confessed 11 times in that prayer of confession this morning, 11 times we said we were sinners. We named sins and sins and sins and sins and sins and sins. And as the psalmist says, if you were to mark iniquity, who can stand? None of us can stand. Which means if God is who he says he is and we are who we just said we are, we need someone to stand between us. And his name is Jesus. Jesus who was crucified on the cross, who, who was the sin bearer, so that the very sins that you've already confessed were placed upon Jesus so that all of God's wrath and all of his curse was poured out upon him. This Jesus was raised from the dead so that you might be right with God. And he ever lives to make intercession. He ever lives to stand between a holy God and a sinful Sean and a sinful Sarah and a sinful you. To stand before God and you so that you might be forgiven and you might be set free. That's what the word of God teaches you. 1 Timothy chapter 2, there is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all. Didn't Jesus already tell you that? That he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom, as a purchase price, so that by his blood you might be set free? This is what Jesus does. As the great prophet, he declares his word to you. As the great priest, he comes as your mediator. His opponents know this. That's why they want to destroy him, as verse 18 tells you. And yet, that's not all he says here. Because when they finally confront him, the commission from the Sanhedrin, they discover that he's a prophet, yes, and a king, and a, and a priest, yes, but above all, he's a king. They ask him the question, a kingly question, ultimately, in verse 28, by what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority to do them? In rabbinical fashion, Jesus turns the tables, asks them a question. In verse 30, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. Now again, that feels like a non sequitur, doesn't it? Jesus, tell us about your authority. We want to know the answer to that. Well, you tell me about the baptism of John. Like, how does that follow? But it does. I mean, think back to John's baptism. We saw at the very beginning of the Gospel of Mark. You remember what happened there? The sky was ripped open, and the dove descended upon Jesus, and the voice of the Father declared, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. You are my Son. You are the promised King. And in doing this, you fulfill all righteousness, just as you told John. And so, there at... Jesus' baptism at the very hands of John is a public declaration of who Jesus actually is. He's the king. He's the son of God. And so here's the question. If John's baptism is of divine origin, and that scene then was, was right and just, the declaration of Jesus is the son of God and the true king, 
than the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the chief priests and the elders needed to believe. But if, if John's baptism was of human origin, then Jesus was not who he claimed to be because he submitted himself to a mere man-made ritual, something that was devised by John himself, rather than submitting himself perfectly and wholly to the laws of God. And so whether they understood it or not, the Jewish authorities were on the horns of a dilemma. All we know is that they were concerned about the crowds. But in the end, what do they say? They said, we do not know. Of course, that was a cop-out. Because their problem wasn't really ignorance, was it? Their problem wasn't ignorance. No, their problem was actually a problem of unbelief. Because here, standing before them, this person that they are questioning was God's perfect priest, the one who stands between a just, holy God and sinful humanity. Standing before them was God's perfect prophet, the one who came in the line of Moses, the one to whom Moses pointed and said, listen to him. Standing before them was God's appointed king, the one of whom the father said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. They refused to believe in him, not because they were ignorant about the truth concerning him. No, they refused to believe in him because they didn't want to. It was a problem of unbelief. But you might be in that place. You might be here today and you know the truth about Jesus. And if you didn't know it before, you know it now. That Jesus is this prophet, priest, and king who comes with authority. The problem this morning for you as you stand on the cusp of commitment isn't ignorance. It, it's actually, it's actually a, a want-to issue. It's an unbelief issue. Because after all, you hear him now declaring his word with power and authority, demanding a response. You've seen him placarded before you as the one who is the ransom of God, who stands between a holy God and sinful humanity. You see him before you as the beloved son in whom the father is well pleased. You can see, you can hear, you can know all of this. You can be right on the cusp and yet not commit yourself to Jesus, not trust in him, not receive him, not rest upon him, not embrace him. Is that you? Is that you? Standing at that crossroads. Don't you see that if you, you linger there, you actually stand in the place of these religious leaders? The only solution, the only solution for you is to ask God to open your eyes. Open your ears. Open your heart. And you, you can do that right now. You can do that right where you're sitting. You don't need to raise your hand. You don't need to come forward. All you need to do is to pray and just say, Jesus, I want to hear, and I want to see, and I want to believe in you. I hear your word. I see you as a mediator. I know that you're a king. Please take me. Take me as I am and save me. Amen. You can pray that right now, right where you are, because Jesus will answer that prayer. How do I know that? He's already told you. Verse 24, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Above all, whatever that has to do with, above all, it has to do with God's mercy. If you come to Jesus and trusting yourself to him, asking him to open your eyes and your ears and your heart, asking him to save you, he will. And I'm saying that not on the authority of a church or denomination or my own authority. I'm saying that on the authority of Jesus the Messiah. It's his word. It's his invitation. It's his mercy. Come to him. Don't tarry. Come to him. Please pray with me. Father, Son, Spirit, we do come to you, Triune God, and we ask 
that you would open eyes and open hearts, open ears, move us so that we might be those who are enabled to embrace you as you are offered to us in the gospel. King Jesus, we long for you to root out all the thorns and thistles in our hearts and lives. We know that you are coming again and you will, you will extend your rule as far as the curse is found. Lord, start with us so that we might know your joy, the joy that truly belongs to all the world in the last day. If we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Please take your